So now, sellers' representations. So um, this says that the seller's representations contained in this paragraph shall survive the closing. So what that basically means is that if your seller lies to the buyer about this kind of stuff, then um, it, they could be sued after the closing. And it gets a little, um, a little complex and a little um, weird um, because it, you just need to understand what it's saying. It's saying that the seller has no knowledge of any of these things nor has the seller received any written notice from any association or governmental entity regarding any of those these things. So in other words, he has not been notified that there's any pending rezoning. Uh, he has no knowledge of any zoning, building, or fire health code violations, no boundary line disputes, no eminent domain proceedings, no easements that aren't shown on the surveys. There's no hazardous waste on the real estate. And basically, A through F is pretty standard kind of stuff. But G says no real estate tax exemptions to which the seller is not lawfully entitled. So I want to talk about that one for just a second. What we're saying here is that we have some sellers, I'm sorry, we have some buyers who have bought property. And when they bought that property, there was a homestead exemption in place. And they are investors, but they have never done anything and that homestead exemption by mistake by the county no doubt is still in place they're not entitled to a homestead exemption they are not a um they do not own or occupy that property so what we're saying and when we do the proration of the taxes it's going to be on the last known tax bill well the last known tax bill was for a couple who homesteaded in other words they lived in the property and this guy's taxes could have been three four five thousand dollars more so he can't, he's got to disclose if he's got any exemptions on there, which he's not entitled to. H says, to the best of his knowledge, there are no improvements to the real estate for which the required initial and final permits were not obtained. So what this is saying is that, for example, if this seller had finished off his basement, that he basically went and got his permits. Not only did he get his permits, but he went through all of the inspections that were required for those permits, and he got a final occupancy permit after the permit after the work was done. If he did not get permits, then he has to disclose to the buyer he did not get the permits. The buyer then will decide whether or not he still wants to purchase this property without the permits. I've talked to many attorneys about this. Um, many of our what pretty pretty active, busy um, attorneys, and basically what they've told me is it's about 50-50 depending on what they didn't get the permits for. So your seller does have to disclose it um, if they didn't get the improvements. Now remember, this is to the best of their knowledge. So if I bought a house five years ago, 10 years ago, and the basement was already finished, I have no way of knowing whether that previous owner had got a what got a permit. So my disclosure would be I've got nothing to disclose. As far as I know, all of the what the permits were obtained. This is really only if they know for sure that there were no permits obtained. So they would just um, in the counter back. My seller would just say we cannot leave line 295 in the contract because I didn't get the permits for and maybe it's I replaced my toilet. Maybe it was I replaced my water heater. Maybe it was that I, what, we had somebody, more than one somebody, some buddies, who did not get a permit to put a room addition on their house. Now I, for the life of me, cannot figure out how you can put a room addition on without getting caught by the municipality, but it's happened more than once. That's a huge problem. I don't think anybody should be buying a house without a permit for a, um, a room addition put on the back of the house. But we've seen it um, with fences with no permits. Now you got to worry about whether or not those per those fences are encroaching and have to be moved. So the seller has to disclose whether or not they got all of the improvements. Um, so it, the seller further goes on to say there are or are not improvements to the real estate which are not included in the full determination of the most recent tax assessment. By the way, the number one reason people do not go get permits is to not get taxed on that improvement. So there's a good chance that even if they lied about H, they're going to have to initial 
that there are no improvements which are not included in their most recent tax assessment and there's a high probability no permit it's not in the tax assessment um, that's why that's there the next one says there are not there are or are not improvements to the real estate which are eligible for the home improvement tax exemption because those uh, have a a what they run out so if you've got a home improvement tax exemption um, then you better disclose it because the taxes are going to be higher in the years to come um, and then we get into the um, special service areas or special assessment areas. So all we're saying here, and if you're a buyer agent, this issue of unconfirmed pending special assessments or special service areas, the special service areas should be in the MLS. It's mandatory that I put in there that it's in a special service area. Um, if you are a buyer agent, it would seem to me that unless you have been told about any of these four things, that I am not initialing or I'm checking the box that says there are not improvements which are not included. There are not improvements which are eligible. It is not, there is no unconfirmed pending special assessment and it is not located within a special assessment area. My buyer is going to, I'm going to check not, 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 not. My buyer is going to initial it. And now the burden is on the listing agent when they go through this contract to say to the seller, can you initial this attesting to the fact that none of these things are in place? And when the seller comes back and says, no, I can't, um, I don't have my finished basement in the most recent tax assessment or whatever, or there is a pending special assessment then uh, the listing agent is going to just and so let me just say that when you have an offer on my listing and i should have done this in the beginning there's one of two ways the counter offer is going to happen either i the listing agent i'm going to take this contract sit down with my seller and i'm going to be changing everything crossing out what we don't want putting in what we do want on what you sent me and we're going to have my seller initial all of those changes. I'm going to send it back to you and your buyer is going to initial them and we have a deal when my seller signs. Or I am going to email you. I'm going to call you and say, change this line, this line, this line, cross this line out, do this. I'm going to send you an email that says this is what we need you to do because all of it should be followed up in writing. So I'm hard pressed here more than any place else to exactly say how this is going to come down um, because it could be that I just have my seller check the box that says there are improvements um, and then I have to have your buyers initial that we moved it from R not to R if we're going to send it back to you and do it all on the one that the buyer agent wrote. Does that make sense? So you're going to have to look at this and figure out how it's done in your, and by the way, that's marketplace specific. There's some, and agent specific. Um, some agents like to do it so that we have a, um, a paper trail, if you will, of how we got from the original contract to the final one by just doing everything on the same original contract. Um, next is, um, that was just the end of that first of that last one. This is the real estate tax escrow. It is not used very often, but in the event the real estate is improved, but has not been previously taxed, the entire year is currently improved. We're going to hold out 3% of the purchase price until we figure out what the tax bill is. And here's an example. Um, a developer bought a $250,000 house, pretty much tore it down and built an $800,000 house. Um, the tax bill for last year was on a $250,000 house for almost the entire year. Well, the tax bill might have been, let's say it was for five months, it's six, eight months of the year, but now we've got to figure out the taxes for um, the last four months of the year and this next coming year are going to have to be factored on the $800,000 house. So it's only if there's been a huge change in the property and it was not taxed. Same thing happens if it was vacant land and now we build a house. Um, so the vacant land is how it was taxed. We may have to adjust those taxes. So that's what that one is for. This just defines business days and hours. Uh, but I do need to explain real quick. You'll see something in here jumping out at you, I'm sure. Uh, business hours are defined as 8 a.m. to 6 p.m. Chicago time. Uh, I know you're going, say what? There is no Chicago time. Yeah, well, we have people who didn't know what Central Standard and Central Daylight Time was. So that's part of the reason it's in there. But the other part of the reason it's in there is that we have a lot of transactions with our friends and neighbors in Indiana, and they don't always change their times. 
So it was much easier for just us to just, and there are people across the country who have a hard time figuring out what all of this means. So we just decided Chicago time made sense, even if it's not official. Um, and then it says in the event, the closing or loan contingency date in this contract does not fall on a business day, we automatically make it the next business day so we don't have to be making counter offers. So um, if I put the wrong closing date in there, um, I put a closing date in there that turns out to be a Sunday because I didn't look at a calendar when I wrote it up, or the loan contingency date calls for 45 business days. Now I know 45 business days should not make that thing fall on a what, on a, um, on a weekend, but it could fall on a what, a holiday um, or whatever. Um, so um, that's the, a federal holiday. So that's why we put it in there, just to be able to put that into the um, into the next business day if necessary, without making an official change to the contract. This simply says that electronic or digital signatures are legal and binding for um, the um, negotiations of this contract. So if you are using uh, dot loop or you're using DocuSign or you have a PDF and they are signing the contract with an official signature in a PDF. Um, all of that is absolutely fine um, in the negotiating of contracts. Now, talk to your managing brokers about that. We want to make sure that we're not telling that your managing broker could say we want somewhat some uh, um, we want what they call it wet signatures um, on things. But uh, for the most part, um, the, everything is fine with the electronic or digital signatures. Um, this is the direction to escrow E. And in every instance where we mentioned the contract could be null and void, um, and it comes up about eight or nine different places in the contract or where the contract can be terminated, it is automatically incorporated the phrase and earnest money refunded upon the joint written direction by the parties to the escrowee or upon an entry of an order by a court of competent jurisdiction. Now, the reason we did this was in order to try to keep this contract from being any more than 13 pages long, we used to have this mentioned every single place where we said contract is null and void or contract is terminated. We put that those three lines in there. We saved a lot of room by putting it all in one place. But what this is saying is that I, it says joint written direction up by the parties. Once the deal falls apart or the transaction is gone, there, for whatever reason, we still, by license law in the state of Illinois, if one of us as brokerage companies is holding the earnest money, we cannot return the earnest money unless we have joint written direction of the parties or specific direction from the attorneys to return the earnest money. Um, and in many cases, the attorneys will not give us that direction. The buyer's attorney, when he writes the letter that says the contract is null and void, my buyer couldn't get their mortgage, we request the return of the earnest money, that is, he is requesting the return. But now we got to get the seller's attorney to sign it. And if the seller is saying, I don't want to give the money back, believe me, that attorney is probably not going to sign it either. So this is just saying we have to have joint written direction of the parties. Um, and then it goes on, starting in pair, line 332, to talk about something that the escrowee could do if, in fact, we're having somebody falls off the face of the earth. So I'll give you the example of why it was originally put in here. We're still using it. Um, but there were times where when we had a lot of a, a lot of short sales going on, a short sale happens when a buyer wants to buy a home where a seller owes more money on the house than the house is going to sell for. And in order for the buyer to be able to buy it, the lender has to approve taking less of a payoff than what they are owed. But the seller still owns the home. The bank does not own it. So we still have to have a seller there to sign all the documents and go to the closing. Well, some of these sellers that we've dealt with were not just um, behind with their payments to their lender. They also owed the IRS. And we think a bunch of people who might have been hired by some unsavory characters because some of these people took off. Some of these people took off and went to live in a tree house in Aruba or whatever, and we couldn't find them. Well, our transaction is now dead. Our transaction cannot close because we cannot find the seller. So how do we get the buyer's earnest money back to them when the seller has is on the lamb, as they used to say in bad black and white movies? So how do we do that? This gives the escrowee the ability to 
send a letter to the addresses that are on the sales contract and say, we're going to give this earnest money back in, let's say, 10 days, in, in 14 days, I'm sorry. And you have 10 days to tell me to not do that. And if you don't say anything to me within 10 days, I'm giving this money back to the buyer. And the license law allows for this. This allows us to be able to move that money. But it is an option on the part of the escrowee. In other words, whoever's holding the earnest money. But it is there. So it is a way, thank goodness, to get the earnest money back to the buyer if we've got a seller who has just what? Just taken off. By the way, it works the other way, too. We've had times where the buyers never showed up at the closing. And the buyer's taken off. They're in the wind somewhere. And we needed to get that money to the seller. The same thing can happen. So it's a way to get it to the right party, if the, to the harmed party, if you will, if somebody takes off. So um, this is the notice paragraph 27. And it does not, this is ev for everything in the contract except uh, paragraph 30. I'll cover that in just a little while where we cover paragraph, when I cover paragraph 30. But this is how we are going to serve notice. Um, it's going to be done in writing. It's served by one party, meaning buyer or seller. They are the parties to or their attorneys to the other party or their attorneys. Um, and, that, and it's going to be done by personal delivery. Or it can be done by mailing it to the address that's on page one, page 13. It can be done by fax. It can be done by email. It can be done by commercial overnight delivery. OK, so those are all the ways that notice can be served. And you and I as realtors do not get involved in the serving of notice as we shouldn't, because the law is notice to an agent is considered notice to their client. So if you were to take a notice that had a time sensitive issue to it, that your buyer had to respond by this date or lose his house or whatever, you get that notice then his time started when you got it. All right, so everybody got that before I go to line 363. If a party fails to provide contact information on page 13, notice may be served upon the party's designated agent in any one of those manners that I just went through. Ladies and gentlemen, the bottom line is we need the buyer's name and mailing address on and the seller's on page 13 of the contract. And we have had many people not putting the addresses on there. Well, we have no way to serve notice if we do not have an address. So it is up to you when you fill out this contract. If you do not put their addresses on page 13, then you will now be getting notices. And let me tell you, there is no way you should ever be getting notices for your clients. The second the last thing on here, G, says the party serving a notice shall provide a courtesy copies to us, the designated agents. Failure to provide such courtesy copies shall not render the notice invalid. So we cannot make the attorneys keep us in the loop when they are sending things to the other attorneys or to the parties. And some of the things they're sending are confidential and we should not have those. OK, so we know that. We're only talking about courtesy copies of stuff that affects the transaction. So this was our attempt to try to get the attorneys to keep us in the loop. If you are still working, if you're buyer, let me read, let me start differently. No attorney that's on your recommended attorney list should be keeping you out of the loop. Does that make sense? So all of the ones you are recommending should keep you informed. If your seller or buyer are using an attorney that does not keep you informed. The only way that you can fix that is that your client, their client, same person, they have to give them a something in writing that says, I want you to keep my agent involved in the transaction. So just know that this is an attempt to uh, solve a problem because sometimes if we don't know what's going on, we can't even get the transaction to the closing table because we totally what? totally don't know. Um, so we're, we're giving it our best shot. But remember, if that still doesn't work, you're going to have to have the client tell the attorney to keep you informed. OK. All right. So this just says that time is of the essence. Um, and it's just a reminder to everybody that um, the the prevailing party, if we have to sue each other, is entitled to collect reasonable attorney fees, costs from the non prevailing party and that we need to move forward in this. And dragging our feet is not um, not in the 
what is is not part of the performance. But very importantly, it talks about the um, getting reasonable attorney fees if somebody ends up suing the other party.